because half my family is Jewish, but somehow I ended up an inbred wasp from Connecticut. And so I, because I grew up knowing way more about Jewish holidays and Christian holidays, and I lived in New York and now LA, I like to think of myself presumptuously as sort of honorary Jew, you know, or Jew adjacent. Um, like I can't tell you when Easter is or even what it really stands for, but I know Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and everything. So hereditarily, I'm an inbred wasp. Spiritually, I'm a Jew, even though I can't pronounce what you just said, the heel. Tikkun Olam. I remember Tikkun was the name of a magazine, too. Uh, so I don't want to repeat myself, but I think I'm probably going to repeat myself. Um, I've been a, a vegan now for 31 years. And, and honestly, like the cause of, of animal rights is my life's work. Um, especially when you think of like all the knock-on consequences of animal agriculture, you know. Just the, the list of statistics, the fact that 45% of climate change is directly attributable to animal agriculture, and 90% of rainforest deforestation, and there's a, I think it was either Lancet or the World Health Organization, very tentatively put forward this idea that the cost of animal agriculture in terms of healthcare costs is approaching $2 trillion a year. You know, so 50% of cancers, 50% of heart disease, 50% of diabetes, on and on and on. 45% um, of California's water use, but yet animal agriculture contributes 0.1% to our GDP. So looking at all the metrics, by all criteria, animal agriculture is the single dumbest thing and cruelest thing that we're doing as a species. Um, but like I assume many of us, because I don't know too many people who've been vegan from birth, except for Joaquin Phoenix, um, and you, yep, and, but so when I was born, and I was actually sort of, practically speaking, raised by animals, you know, I, I, I learned at an early age to never trust humans, no offense, humans, but like the humans around me when I was growing up were chaotic and untrustworthy, but the animals were loving and consistent and dependable and so I grew up with we had adopted rats and cats and dogs and mice and lizards and everything and the animals were so wonderful um, so I grew up with this profound connection to animals but I also had what I think of I used to call it the, the sort of the suburban paradox but I think it's the human paradox of loving some animals but eating other animals. You know, I grew up and I love, like I would every night sleep with our dogs and cats and sometimes the rats because the rats are really adorable and affectionate. But then I would love going to Burger King and McDonald's. And, and to my great shame, I remember the first vegan I met, I was 16 and there was this wonderful punk rock vegan in my high school and I used to ridicule her. So I was like, how can you not eat meat? Meat is great but if anyone had even tried to hurt one of our adopted animals, I would have killed them. So I lived with this inconsistency until um, I adopted a cat named Tucker. And so I loved Tucker so much, he was my best friend. And then one day when I was 19 years old, um, I was sitting on the stairs at my mom's house. And I remember it so clearly, because the stairs had this like orange shag carpeting. And, because I'm old, and, and I was petting Tucker, and I think of this as my, like, my Saul on the road to Damascus moment, where like, in an instant, a switch got thrown in my brain. It was almost like the two hemispheres of my brain got connected, and I suddenly realized that I loved Tucker unconditionally. You know, he was, he had such a strong personality, and he was loving and kind, and he, all he wanted was to live his own life as he chose to live it, free from pain, free from suffering. And in an instant, I suddenly realized every single creature on the planet is exactly the same. And I realized there's a word I don't like, but I don't know of a better way to describe it, which is speciesism. You know, the idea that somehow we look at one creature with two eyes and a rich emotional life and we invite that creature into our house and we laud it and we spend tons of money trying to protect it 
and we buy it presents and we put hats on it and take pictures of it and put it up on social media. And then another creature with two eyes and a central nervous system, we lock in a lightless pen and we treat it terribly, we torture it and we slaughter it. But they're both creatures with two eyes. And I know I'm stating the obvious because a lot of people here are vegans and animal rights activist people, but like, it's such a baffling paradox. Like anyone with a semblance of objectivity would look at those two creatures, let's say a cow and a dog, and say like, they're the same. You know, they both have emotional lives, they both have two eyes, a brain, a central nervous system, and a profound desire to live their own life and avoid pain and suffering. So why do we torture and slaughter one and venerate the other? you know, and protect the other. We even have laws, like if you hurt a dog, you go to prison. If you kill a deer, you cut its head off and mount it on your wall. If you torture a cow, you're called a farmer. You know, it's the same behavior to different creatures with two eyes in the central nervous system. And so when I had this epiphany when I was 19, um, it suddenly made me realize like just this, this moment of awakening, like what are, like as a species, what are we doing? And that's what, the reason I kind of wanted to talk today is because there's one thing that's always seemed baffling and inconsistent to me is to kill a bunch of animals to keep another animal alive. You know, especially when the animal you're keeping alive is an omnivore that you rescued from a city shelter. And I, I'm utterly baffled by that because a dog's life has no more meaning than a cow's life. You know, a cat's life has no more value than a chicken's life. They both have two eyes, they both have central nervous systems, they have the exact same desire to avoid pain and to live a long, happy life. And so that's why I have to congratulate everyone who's here and everyone who's working on this to try and draw attention to that and to provide an alternative. Because I know so many vegans and animal rights people who are so conflicted by this. You know, they have their rescue animal, they have their adopted animals, but they feed them meat. You know, they would never in a million years buy leather shoes, or they would never in a million years eat meat, but they still have to go to Gelson's or John's every day and buy cat food and buy dog food. So anything we can do to end that inconsistency, and anything we can do to stop prioritizing the life of one sentient creature over another sentient creature. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and it's really an honor to be here, thank you. Thank you so much, Moby, that was wonderful. So as you all know, I'm our mighty mama practicing house call veterinarian here in Los Angeles and Thank you all for being here today and opening your heart to the plight of farmed animals as well as dogs who would benefit by a shift in our mindset when it comes to what we're feeding our animal companions. And thank you for opening your mind to the science behind the viability of dogs being plant-based. I've been in practice for about 13 years and I've seen a lot of patients improve dog patients in particular, on a plant-based diet. And this is for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, there are bioaccumulated toxins present in meat-based foods. That means that all these chemicals that are in our environment, which are all around us, whether they're visible or not, they're, they are there. Uh, they range from heavy metal toxins such as arsenic, which is found in chicken in very high amounts, mercury in seafood, as well as petrochemicals, flame retardant chemicals, persistent organic pollutants, as they're called, when they're present even in organic meats. That means that they are there bioconcentrated in flesh tissue. So when a dog eats the flesh of a chicken, that dog is accumulating a lot more toxins in his or her system than what was in the flesh of the chicken. And so now we have an epidemic of cancer in dogs where about 50% of dogs are dying from cancer. And as a veterinarian, I'm tasked with 
helping these animals, and it's not an easy one, especially when end of life comes around and these clients are heartbroken about the demise and ultimate death of their animal companions. And I can't help but wonder if the diet is playing a big role. Uh, as I said, uh, being in practice for 13 years, I've seen dogs have problems at younger ages than they used to, even cancers at younger ages, degenerative diseases, arthritis, kidney disease, liver disease. And when there are so many toxins in our environment, we have to step back and think, how are we actually gonna maximize the health of these animals? Meanwhile, there are dogs that are thriving and many anecdotal reports of dogs doing really well on nutritionally complete and balanced vegan foods. And that brings to light the fact that dogs don't have ingredient requirements, they have nutrient requirements. And their nutrient requirements can be fulfilled from plant, mineral, and synthetic sources. As Moby said, they are omnivores. They don't have an absolute need for animal flesh in order to be healthy and thrive. In fact, there was a study done, um, a short study of sled racing dogs followed over a 16 week period, which found them to have good health and complete blood count was in normal limits on a meat-free diet. The study that we're talking about doing, Dr. Mel Garejo will be speaking more about that in a few minutes, is gonna be much more comprehensive than this other study and will really legitimize in the scientific and veterinary literature and communities the validity and the health benefits, we believe, that will be found from these diets. For one thing, there's the absence of these toxins that are found in the meat-based foods, even organic and premium meat-based foods have persistent organic pollutants. Then we have the carbon footprint. Okay, there are 163 million dogs and cats living in the United States, most of whom are consuming the flesh of animals. When that doesn't need to be the case, especially for dogs. And so billions of animals' lives are at stake here if we can show that this is actually a viable option. And we know anecdotally that it is. And there are over a dozen companies making plant-based dog food. And there have been thousands of dogs doing just fine on these diets. In fact, there are actually prescription veterinary diets that are prescribed for dogs who have allergies to chicken and beef protein, which, by the way, are the chief allergens for dogs. And as a veterinarian, and there are quite a few in the audience too, we can all attest to how common skin allergies are in dogs. It's, you, you, you can't miss a week without diagnosing a few cases of it. I mean, it's that common. So when we have an option that's nutritionally complete, that meets their requirements, that's actually providing relief of allergies, that's minimizing their exposure to carcinogens, and sparing the lives of other sentient beings, why not? So I'm really honored that Dr. Mel Garejo is joining us today. He is a tenured professor of translational medicine at Western University of Health Sciences. He graduated with his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree and a two-year specialty degree in small animal medicine at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in 1988, and then moved to West Lafayette, Indiana to complete his master's degree in clinical sciences and a PhD in pathobiology at Purdue University in 1998. Thereafter, he continued his clinical training at Texas A&M and the University of Pennsylvania where he completed an internship and a small animal medicine and surgery and a residency in small animal internal medicine. Dr. Mel Garejo relocated to Manhattan, Kansas in 2001 when he accepted a position as assistant professor in internal medicine and small animal nutrition in the Department of Clinical Sciences, College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. In 2003, he moved to the KSU Animal Research Facilities in the College 
uh, I'm sorry, he moved to KSU Department of Human Nutrition to serve as the director and supervising veterinarian for the animal research facilities in the College of Human Ecology, and he was promoted to a tenured associate professor in 2009. In 2017, Dr. Melgarejo was recruited by Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. And Western University is one of the newest veterinary schools in the United States. And it's very unique because it has a reverence for life philosophy, which means there are no harmful or terminal uses of animals in the curriculum, which is really innovative. So we're really happy to have uh, Western University on board, and I know it's been a, a challenging road, and, and Dr. Melgarejo is so brave to be embarking on this, so please give him a warm welcome. Thank you everyone, and, and thank you for coming and listening to me. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a, a very brief uh, moment in my life that was very challenging. I loved animals because my dad is an archaeologist and he was always digging pyramids in very old places away from uh, the civilization. So since I was a kid, I was in contact with monkeys and armadillos and deers and macaws and, uh, and to me it was normal. It was just like a way of, of living. And then when we went back to the city, I didn't feel comfortable because I needed to see this magnificent environment. So uh, when we moved to the city, I started gathering animals. And we have a very big house. And we went from uh, cobras to armadillos to foxes to, and my house was really big. And my dad was telling me, it's not really good. And I said, no, that I can take care of that. And I grew like that. So. I said, when I grow up, I need to be around animals. I need to have a job where I, I have the joy to go and deal with animals. And then I went to the vet school and I realized that I could actually learn and help animals. At the end of my career, we need to recite an oath. And part of the oath is that you will use your skills to prevent and uh, any pain and suffering from all animals. So I, I agree with Modi. However, I was not a vegan. I had this uh, idea that I love animals and I treat animals and dogs and cats, but I was not a vegan. Until very recently, uh, about five years ago, that my partner, uh, Dr. Anikalini, was finishing a class at uh, Cornell University, uh, plant-based nutrition certificate and she sat with me and she said look you're a very smart guy listen to this evidence you know and it took me <clears throat> as a mexican it's, it's just very difficult it's very the culture is very difficult and so i went from that night to the morning and i said that's it i'm no longer doing it and when i visit mexico my bro said was it difficult for you to do it was it don't you miss that? And of course not, I was a hypocrite. I was enjoying the benefit of the uh, animal fat, and, uh, but I was not actually doing my job to prevent and avoid suffering. So today, I don't want to talk about the 20 minutes about my uh, experiences, but I'm gonna talk briefly about the, the study, and then I would open the forum for questions because this is where people actually learn the most. And sometimes you don't have enough time to make a question, so I want to try to create a short answer, 30 seconds to a minute to each question, and then I'll be happy to do it after that. The point of, of what I'm here is that there's no scientific study that actually is showing or assessing what may be the benefits of a plant-based nutrition for dogs. There are uh, one study that Dr. Uh, May mentioned, but there's nothing there. So. In order to start uh, with a very good, um, uh, solid step, we need to document and we need to assess what are the health and nutritional benefits of a plant-based diet. And we need to do it with clinically healthy dogs. We need to, the idea is, the, the experimental design is to take dogs that are clinically healthy above one year of age 
and then those dogs are going to be with a meat-based diet and I'm going to talk to the clients they're going to sign a consent where they're going to say I'm going to switch from that animal uh, based diet to a plant-based diet within one week just to make sure that the, the GI gets uh, adjusted and then I would like to follow your dog for at least four months and then we are going to measure everything that we can measure. And that's why the, the study is expensive. We would like to measure the complete, the complete uh, blood count. We would like to measure the chemistry panel, the glucose, the cholesterol, the triglycerides. We would like to measure electrolytes. We would like to measure everything that we can measure. And also we are going to uh, look at the, the thyroid hormones with the panel, um, uh, the hormonal panels. We are going to look at what happens with that microbiota. What happens when you eat a plant based diet and you were an animal uh, based uh, dog, what happens with your intestinal bacteria? And we would like to document what is happening with that. Because nowadays we don't in vet medicine have a clear concept of what is the good bacteria or the health biome or the pathobiome, what is the bad bacteria. We have some idea, but we really don't know. And then we are going to follow by uh, body scores, muscle uh, scores, we are going to do physical examination, we are going to look for urine to see are they forming any crystals, any uh, stones in the urinary bladder. We would like to do this, uh, we are going to look at the dogs every week for physical examination and we would like to do it for at least four months. Now one question that I have asked for, why four months? Because science is expensive. So on average, every month that we add is going to cost about three thirty thousand dollars So if we really would like to do a study for six months, you're looking at close to $200,000. But I believe that we can, in four months, we can document for the first time that clinically healthy dogs can live a happy, healthy life, not anecdotically, but actually with a scientific basis. Look at the albumin, look at the red blood cells, look at the white blood cells, look at the microbiome, and see these dogs are uh, doing as well with this diet than with your previous diet. Eventually, we would like to uh, do it a, a, a year study. That would be amazing for, for vet medicine. Uh, a, a pet food company just finished a study, well, not finished just recently, but they just finished a study 13 years. They were following these Labradors, 48 Labradors that were seven liters, and they had the money to follow them over uh, the lifespan. And the only thing that they, they, this, this study concluded is that these uh, 24 dogs, they were fed full calorie requirements. These 24 dogs, they were given 75% of the caloric requirements. And guess what? The dogs that were given 75%, they live longer and they have less chronic debilitating diseases. So calorie restriction actually works. Now, we don't have $25 million to set up uh, animal center and to put some pools and to put really uh, and to attract the students to do a long-term study so I am here as a scientist to try to evaluate what are the health and nutritional benefits of a plant-based diet this is what I have been doing for 28 years and I, I'm going to close for the questions uh, with, a, with an um, um, an event that happens when I came here uh, to the United States. My uh, advisor, I was at Purdue, and said, Tona, you're going to present your work in this seminar, in this Congress. Fine, I was excited. Happened to be that the Congress, we were the only two vets. They were MDs that were specialists in gastroenterology. There was the American Gastroenterology Association meeting. I presented my work. 12 minutes, three minutes for questions. The first question, one of the MDs looked at my eyes and said, can you say it in English, please? That was the welcome to the United States to the scientific community. And you know what? Probably he was right. When I came here, I didn't speak English. I was mute. I had the, the desire to improve my knowledge. I did not speak English. I could read English, but I could not speak it. So I said, you know what? What this person doesn't know is he's dealing with the most stubborn person in life. <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, when people agree with me, I know I'm wrong. <laughs> this guy didn't agree with me. That means, Tona, study, improve your English, and do an outstanding presentation 
next time that you stand in front of people. And from that moment, I have been doing probably 100 to 120 hours of continuing education a year around the world. So I go and talk to people and I try to tell them I love animals and that's what it moves me. My students are the, the most amazing things but the animals, I'm here to prevent pain and suffering. Thank you. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Oh, I'm not sure about the program, but yes. So the question from one of uh, the members of the audience is what kind of food? And what we are, uh, we have identified two foods. We are not married to any brands. One is going to be Halo, uh, the vegan, and the other one is going to be Bee Dog from San Francisco. Uh, and I have been in contact with those people. Those are the two vegan dogs. Related to that, there are companies that know what they're doing and they are noticing this plant-based situation. And one company from England, actually now they have a commercial available vegan diet in the market, but they don't call it vegan. They call it vegetarian for skin disorders. But when you look at the ingredients from that, it's 100% vegan. So companies are noticing that, but they are afraid of, of jumping to that. But the question is those two diets and maybe the third diet. We like one of these companies because they are fully dedicated to plant-based diet nutrition in dogs. And there are other companies made uh, do the meat based and use the same machine, so we want to avoid anything. We want to actually dedicate a plant based diet for dogs, but we have we have identified those two. Yes, so the, I'll so, just repeat the question uh, about age of the dogs. Yes, no, one I, year I, old. I, I could hear. So that's an excellent question, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, we are going to be looking at clinically healthy dogs one year, uh, uh, for one year to 10 years for four months because we are, we are trying to demonstrate to the uh, scientific community and the owners that switching from a meat-based to a plant-based, first of all, it doesn't create any diarrhea, it doesn't create any gastrointestinal awful things and your dog is going to thrive and going to be clinically healthy. If we want to do puppies, then that would be uh, Jim, an amazing study. If we could take three months old to one year, this is where the uh, nutritional uh, insufficiencies happen. Actually, when you switch the diet and these dogs are growing, they need the protein, they need the minerals to grow healthy for the bones. And that you want to show that um, plant-based diet may not be useful for uh, puppies or not. Anecdotically, I can tell you one thing. I am very fortunate to walk, uh, go around the world. And when I visit uh, Asia and, and Africa, I'm going to actually uh, Singapore and Indonesia in a couple of weeks. Some of these dogs, they have never seen meat. They have never, uh, they don't even know that. And I know one of uh, my acquaintances told me, I feed them dehydrated alfalfa for the cows plus lentils in a soup. And that's why, they, and look at the, the, the female uh, the dogs, they're having puppies, the puppies are growing great. But you know, this is an observational thing. But for scientific purposes, this is a completely different study, Jim. And I think that would be amazing to, to show that actually a plant-based, you can grow puppies healthy. Now, I can tell you in theory, this study that uh, this big company did for, they took the puppies when they were three months of age they follow them the lifespan. When they were three months of age, they give them 75% calorie restriction. That means that the protein was 20 to 21%. These plant-based diets, they may have between 23 and 25%. So there's a good chance that actually plant-based diet is going to show that even it's great for puppies. But it's not my word. And I'm here as a scientist to demonstrate to the scientific community, look, this is the data. You may not like me because of my aspect, because I'm Mexican, because you know I'm a vegan uh, veterinarian, but look at the science. And that's, that's my goal. I'm an academician, and I most likely will die as an academician, 
uh, in a university. But this is where we are doing. This would be amazing, but the cost of that study is uh, is much bigger than $125,000. But that's an excellent question. I would love to do that study. Thank you, Jim. Any other question? And yes. I'll repeat the question so it gets recorded in case okay. you, if you want to come up, you're welcome to do that too. Do you have candidates for the study already? Well, um, the study needs to be done with uh, uh, client-owned animals, which I don't like the word client-owned, but pretty much with uh, dogs that live in a standard household in the United States, and most of them are going to be done by students or faculty. I have talked to some faculty, and some of them are curious about it. And the good thing about this study is that we are going to put these uh, um, animals that are living with people um, in this diet, and we are going to monitor them so closely that they're going to be better taken care by a licensed veterinarian than what they do right now. If you check a dog every week for four months, no one is taking their bed every week for four months. No one is looking at the, uh, the blood work, at the chemistry, at the urine, uh, at the fecal microbiome, the fecal score, the body score. So I think students are very supportive, but as a good students, very, uh, a good amount of students would like to have something. And we need to have about rewards. How are we going to reward the student either through uh, money or uh, food or something? But um, we have 200 students that we have in campus and 60 something faculty. So, I'm sure that we can we can do that, and we are going to do it in phases. We're going to do 12 dogs and 12 dogs, and then jump start it, and then we're going to do another 12 dogs and 12 dogs. But I'm hoping that everything is going to be located in Pomona and Claremont just for logistic purposes. Uh, it's difficult to drive to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So I am uh, uh, hopeful that uh, that's going to happen. It was an excellent question. Thank you. Anyone else? Deborah Vulgaris, Dr. Deborah Vulgaris. Um, so I'm a veterinarian also, and I know that you guys have been under so much attack for this, so I just want to commend you all because I know that this became very personal and a little threatening at times. Um, so I think it's amazing what you're doing. I have a question about taurine, and I know that one of the things that people are, the people on the other side of this are going to start screaming about heart issues and you know cardiomyopathies and all of that, and I'm just kind of wondering, is there any plan? I know that for this study, we have to. There's going to be some limitations, obviously, for cost. But is there any, um, I don't know, plan to assess heart or or discussion about that? Because taurine, I know, I know that this is going to be a big issue going forward, and people are going to start being very saying how it's going to lead to heart disease, which we know that it won't. But but we'll find out for sure. Do you have any plans to assess that in yeah. any way? Thank you. So the question was about checking the taurine levels in relation to heart health in dogs and how that will be uh, studied. Okay, so thank you for your first comment. Uh, when I talked to my dean, uh, he is aware of what I'm doing and I told him you hire me to do research, top-notch research and progressive. So this is a scientific study as any other scientific. I work with hyenas and with water buffaloes and stingrays and whales and, and all, all when I go around. So it's not my only area. So uh, my university support is as long as I do it in a scientific way. And I'm, I, I stay, stay away from all this uh, conflict of interest and things like that. So I'm here as a scientist. That's number one, but thank you. It has not been an easy road, but we are here. Second of all, uh, the taurine, it's a very good question. Um, what I think very few people know is that taurine that is used in, uh, to supplement the uh, meat-based diets, they are supplemented with taurine. They don't, re uh, they don't rely on the uh, taurine present in the meat, so they supplement it, and that is a synthetic molecule. The same molecule that is used for, for meat-based is used for plant-based. Uh, the two companies that we have identified, they supplement taurine and they actually uh, fulfill all the requirements from the AFCO uh, diet. So we, they are well balanced, they have all the minerals, all the situations, and they are, we are going to be looking in the physical examination, uh, doing everything, and we believe that there's something that we need to evaluate at that point. We have 
uh, in the group of uh, veterinary cardiologists uh, with, a, with a residency that it would be to be able to actually help us with that. But we are going to be looking into that, and that's an excellent question. This is the kind of questions that people are, are asking. Uh, I took my dog to a, a, a veterinarian in Claremont, and she told me, it's amazing what you're doing, but I wouldn't put my dog on a vegan diet. You know, why? Because there's no scientific evidence. If there's a, uh, one paper and said, you know what, look at this, and then the next question is what Jim is telling me, but what, how do I know that the puppy is going to be fine? What if the puppy gets into this plant-based diet, okay? So let's just take it one step at a time. It's an excellent question. Thank you, and if I can just add about the taurine, since there are precursors to taurine, methionine and cysteine, those are present in a lot of the grains, such as corn, oat, and wheat. And with the advent of grain-free diets, which is somewhat of a fad, in my opinion, that isn't really based in science, that has led, in some cases, to the taurine deficiency in dogs that are prone to that. So I tend to recommend a, a more balanced diet, and the, the foods that are going to be suggested, the V-Dog and Halo, do have a good balance of grains, so they also have taurine. And I think the, the dogs are going to be covered that way. So thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, evolution is a balanced diet. It's APCO approved. Recommended. I feed it to my cats, actually. The, the diet evolution? Yes. Yes, yeah. I mean, there are different uh, um, companies. Uh, the, the other company that I told you, uh, I don't work for any company and I don't buy any any um, thing and I don't receive any money from any company, but uh, Royal Canning has this diet that it's also vegan and it's available and few people know it. So we need to evaluate what we have, but I think we just anecdotally, because B Dog has thousands of clients that uh, they have been buying the, the food and they're quite happy and they live around in Los Angeles when we do the, the study with these uh, plant based dogs. So that's why we, we decided on, on doing that. But the evolution, I have heard that it's a, it's a great diet. As long as it's approved and it's a well balanced diet, I believe, and that's why we need to document that the protein, once it reaches the intestine, the dog is not going to ask, this is animal protein, this is plant uh, protein, I'm going to digest, as long as it's a highly digestible, clean, plant-based uh, protein, I think we are going to do very well. But that's the reason we are doing the study. Yes? Um, you mentioned that um, you're going to start with 12 dogs, and then you're going to have 12 additional dogs, and so on. I was just wondering, Will the initial group of 12 dogs be studied for the entire four months at least? Yeah. So uh, the, the study design is to take 25 and 25, follow 25 dogs, plant-based and 25 meat-based. Oh. We are going to split that in half, and we're going to start with 12 dogs, plant-based, and 12 dogs, meat-based. Once they move on through the weeks, we are going to start with a second batch of 12 dogs and 12 dogs. So it's going to be totally about 48 dogs. So it's going to be probably 13 and 13, 12 and 12, but we cannot jump start with 50 dogs because the facilities at the, at the, at the university, they see dogs and they're very, really busy. So they're great, uh, very gracious to let us use some of the examples. We need to be prudent with the amount of dogs that we, we bring to the university. That's the only reason. But each dog will be studied over four months. Each dog, every single dog that is in the study is going to be studied over at least four months. If there is a, other, I'm writing grants, if there's any more money coming from federal, state uh, agencies or donations, I would love to extend it at least for six months or a year. Yes. Dr. Castillo. Hi, thank you so much for what you're doing. I am from Mexico as well, and I'm curious about what are the other veterinarians at your school thinking, if you have any opposition or support, and how do you deal with other vets? Are not uh, in my school, it's, uh, it's not very um, clear because I'm a new faculty and they know that I, some people that I'm a plant-based uh, diet because when I go to gatherings, I say, uh, there's nothing vegan here, so please next time bring something. Um, but I think to say the least, they are curious. Academia usually is a very respectful environment. Once you leave the university is when you you see the real world. I mean, the people that I mean say a lot of fit things through the uh, media. 
but academia they're very respectful so I, I think one one a very good situation and, and I, I want to share that about that I just spoke in Latin America and I was speaking about internal medicine but my last talk whether they like it or not it's called the vegan dog and it's 15,000 years of carnivore diet so I, I speak uh, and I tell them about the evidence, the strong evidence that we have with the science paper and the nature paper and all these things. And they were fascinated with that. However, and I talk about plant-based diet for humans, one person stood up and he said, you know that this is the state that is the most powerful in agriculture. We produce more beef and more meat than any other state in this country. And you're, you're here telling me that meat is bad. Mm. And that's the first time I, uh, so I said, well, I'm just telling you what is the best for your dog and your cat based on the evidence. And there's plenty of, re of resources that talks about plant-based diet for humans. The interesting thing is that he was not very nice and very aggressive. So the people in the community kind of like sheltered me and then he left, but his son stayed. His son was a young vet and he just sat in the first row and he was listening to me and the dad was from the outside telling him <laughs> and the guy was like <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't direct my, my attention to him but said for you young veterinarians listen to that read there is uh, documentation and I'm trusting that you counting on you to produce more scientific evidence and at the end of that talk the amazing thing is that Someone raised their hand and said, you know what? I have this client that the only thing that he gives is uh, uh, lentils and this, and then another client and another better. And suddenly it was almost like a, a magical moment. Everyone had been seeing plant-based, but they were afraid to talk. They were afraid to talk to other people because they, I was speaking to veterinarians and vet students. So suddenly when they felt like I'm safe, I can live out of that, it was a, a very good moment. We need to support that with science, you know? It would be amazing to say, you know guys, thank you. But look at this. This study, four months, six months, let's just, you know, make history. We are going to present the data in a scientific way. Whatever results we got, we're going to go and say, this is it. I'm not married because science is fluid. But thousands of anecdotal evidence are telling me, most likely, this is a very good thing and I want health for the planet for the people and, and for our companion animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I'd like to let everybody know that we've had a fundraiser on Facebook and we've had a GoFundMe and we have a magical donor, uh, an anonymous donor who has given us $50,000 and at this moment, At this moment, we have $67,000, and we have another another $7,000 in pledges. So 67 and seven is 74. So we have $74,000. We need to get to $125,000 in order to reach, to be able to qualify to do the study at Western University. And because Dr. Mel Garejo is a tenured professor, he pretty much gets to study what he wants to study. And the university is behind him, but he has to bring in the funds. So all of your money that, has, that was either raised online through, fund, through GoFundMe or through Facebook, and any additional donations that we receive from the silent auction, or if anybody, I'm gonna ask, you know, I'm getting ready to ask you for money. Um, any money that we receive here, those checks will go directly to Western University. I'd like to try to avoid commissions of having to go through GoFundMe, because we have to pay a commission to them. And for Facebook, there is no commission, but we, we want that money to go directly to Western University. And the money for tickets is going to pay for this event and the leftover is going to go directly to Western University. No one here has received any compensation for putting on this event. We have all done this as a as a gesture of kindness because we want to make history. So I just want to thank I want to thank my team because they've worked so incredibly hard to make this to get this 
to make this happen. So I'd like to just ask you, can we do, we, we can open up bidding, we can talk about, is anybody willing to make a donation? Now, it's about 2,000, roughly $2,000 per dog, correct? A hundred thousand, well, twenty-five thousand dollars. Twenty-five thousand of the hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Twenty-five thousand dollars is going towards the toxicology study. That doesn't require dogs. That just requires dog food and all of the labs. So that's part one of the study. Part two of the study is actually looking at the the meat-based dogs and the plant-based dogs, and that's roughly a hundred thousand dollars. So if we have fifty dogs in the study, I know we talked about forty-eight. Let's just make it fifty because it's easier to calculate. That comes out to $2,000 a dog. Does anybody want to sponsor five dogs? Do I have five dogs? Yeah. <laughs> I think you have, can't be a minor. <laughs> Christina has so, the iPad. She'll go around if anyone wants to submit a If anybody is interested in, in, in sponsoring five dogs, so five times two. That would be 10000 That would be $10,000. And that would also designate the person as a bronze sponsor as a bronze sponsor. sponsor and our silver sponsors are 25,000 25, and then gold sponsor would be 50,000 so we already have a gold sponsor but we can have another gold sponsor I mean that, that would certainly be fine fine with us as well um, does anybody want to sponsor four dogs can I hear four dogs <laughs> we have an aspiring veterinarian here <laughs> anybody want to sponsor three dogs do I hear three dogs Should we go over the silent auction items? And we can go over the silent auction items. Okay, if anybody wants to sponsor a half a dog, that would be fine. <laughs> oh, a thousand, actually. Oh, a thousand. This is Paige Parsons Road Thank reporting you. live at the fundraiser <laughs> for plant-based okay. dog so food research. We are in the heart of Los Angeles and Woodland Hills. This beautiful spread was, was brought on by an incredible Dr. Rosenberg Chef, has I'm looking a, for a her beautiful heart now. Uh, but you can see there's some Yogos cheese here, here, some delicious fruits, and, and so forth. This is <laughs> catering by Danny's <laughs> Vegan <laughs> Eats and Sweets. And, and she's she located right meals. in the heart of Los Angeles and as well in Woodland Hills. Never, so, ever, ever as Lisa continues, before. Lisa Carlin continues on with the bidding and the silent auction, I just want to show you this incredible spread. And, and I, thank I, you for you coming out, uh, all of you Zoe that arrived here today. Those of you that are watching, she is, thank you so um, a much DXC for joining us today. At the age of 15, she's 16. Paige Parsons Roach, and I'm going to sign off now, but thank you again for joining us with Jane Unchained News Network. Stay tuned. We are going to come back with some more information for you, some interviews, some close-ups, and maybe even some live music. Thank you for being here today.